Hello? Yeah. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm not interested. I, I filled out the form, but you're like the fifth person that's called me this week. Just give me an offer and I can tell you if I'm interested. How would you respond? How would you respond? How would you respond? So, can you tell me what's been going on? Why are people calling? How would you respond? What's the lowest you'll take? <laughs> How would you respond? I would respond, sir, I know everybody is calling me. This is a job that we do, but when you order the machine, we will take a car. We have driving. So let me take a couple of questions. Okay, I want you and you and you to come up with me on the stage. Let's go. Now, if I asked your competitors the same objection, how do you think they would respond? They would say, well, you know, if you're interested, we want to get some more information on it. Mm. We're, gonna, we're gonna see what we can do. Mm. Talk to some money partners. Mm. Let's do some stuff right like in the that. first 30 seconds, how would they respond? Your competitors calling the same leads. How would they respond to that same objection? More aggressive. Okay. You want to get your money. okay. What does that mean? How how are you aggressive and gonna cause the prospect to want to do a deal if you're aggressive? You just have to be natural. Try to get confidence in. Trying to mm. talk to the, to the person. Do you think the prospect cares if you're confident on a cold call? Well, you have to oh. get into that. Level. Okay, and how would your competitors respond to that same objection that I just gave you? In your mind, how do you think they'd respond? Five people, wow. Mm. Out of 17,000 agents that we have in Las Vegas, only five people are calling you. This is why we, we need to meet so the calls can stop. Are you free today or tomorrow? We I'm need to meet. Okay. Now, we need to meet on a cold call. Oh, you need to meet me. Oh, I'm all in. Now, what I think I heard all of you just kind of say in your mind, because you guys were kind of like, eh, eh, I love you, I still love you, is that in your prospect's mind, you all sound the what? You sound the same. Could that be a problem for you? Okay. Would you lovely people come back down? Now, be on your toes because I probably will have you come back up. I just want to be real. And you, all of you out here, I've been known to do some weird things, so you might want to pay attention because I might bring you up here. Okay. You guys are awesome. Now, if I asked you to describe the word sales or selling in one word, what would that word be? Somebody tell me in the audience. Relationship, serve, what else? Information. Information, is that what selling is? What else? Solutions. What? Solutions. Solutions. Trust. 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 Ooh, I like that. Oh, you guys are sharp. What if we, I like all those answers. Somebody just, they, they must be one of our clients because they said something. You see, what if we took everything all of you just said and we wrapped it in one word and that word was change. You see, all selling is, all sales are, is change. That's it. It's about how good you are. So whether the prospect is wanting something better or they're moving away from pain, it's all about change. It's about how good you are at getting the prospect to view that in their mind, that by them changing their situation, that means what? For your industry, accepting your offer. That by them doing that, that is far less risky for them than them doing nothing at all, staying in the status quo, their problems stay the same, and nothing ever changes. Which is more risky? Now, here's your problem though. Human beings don't like change, even though we say we do. Think about that for a second. All selling is, is change, yet human beings do not like change. Now, why do we not like change? Well, we especially do not like change 
when it's initiated by some pushy, high-pressured salesperson that's ready to pitch their solution early in the conversation. And repeatedly, human behavior shows that we value something that is familiar to us, even if we don't like it that much, compared to something that is new, something that is foreign to us. Raise your hand if you know somebody that always complains about their relationships. They're in a relationship like, oh, this is so horrible. He's so mean to me. She's so bad to me. I just hate being with him. Do you ever wonder why they stay in that relationship? Because they're afraid of what? Change. They're afraid of the unknown. See, that's what you're going up against to some degree with pretty much every prospect you talk to. Now, how do we help human beings, prospects, overcome the fear of change? It's quite easy if you know how. If you don't, really hard. You have to learn. Now, here's how we do it. This is the start. Realize this. You're not, oh, you're not selling the thing. You're selling the results of what that thing does. In your case, you're not selling them on it, accepting your offer. You're selling them on the results of what happens because they accept the offer. You're selling maybe a landlord the uncomfortable feeling of his tenants not paying, and you're able to take that away from him. You're selling them on maybe somebody that is going through a divorce and their credit's gonna get destroyed because they can't afford the home. You're selling them on getting out of that. You're selling somebody on a high mortgage payment, getting rid of that, Maybe they lost their job so their credit doesn't get destroyed. See, that's what you're selling. You're selling the results of what accepting your offer does for them, not the offer itself. Now, how are you gonna have a competitive advantage in the next 12 months? Does your hair look cooler than somebody else? How are you gonna have a competitive advantage? You got lots of people calling the same properties over and over again. What's gonna set you apart from everybody else? Can I make a suggestion? What? Differentiation. Well, how? Better questions. Maybe. Better questions? It could be, maybe. Here it is. The one, this is simply the ones who will make millions and millions of dollars a year, even in the next 12 months, are simply the ones who know how to best communicate with their prospects. The ones who know what to say and ask and how to ask it that cause their prospects to want to open up, to want to engage rather than trying to get rid of you because that's no fun, right? Now, here's what I'm gonna do. Today I'm gonna cover three things, three steps in the 60 minutes that I have. Ryan gave me 65, I've been known to go over than that. He might have to kick me out of here. All right, three steps to becoming the trusted authority, the expert, in your prospect's mind. You might wanna write these down. Number one, become a problem finder and problem solver, not a product pusher. Oh, product pushers do not do that well in our day and age. They don't make that much money. They have to play the numbers game. Oh, that's a lot of work. Number two, asking the right questions, but at the right time, and especially with the right tone. Because there's certain questions that require more of a, a curious tone. And see, your tone is how your prospects interpret the intention behind your questions. Let me repeat that. Your tonality is how your prospects interpret why you're even asking the question in the first place. So there's certain questions that require more of a curious tone. Um, Amy, um, Maybe walk me through some of the details of the home. Like, how many bedrooms do you have? That's a curious tone. There's other questions that require more of a, a confused tone. Oh, oh, hold on. How do you mean it's about to go into foreclosure? What's been going on? That's a confused tone. There's other questions that require more of a, a challenging or skeptical tone. What happens if you don't do anything about this and your credit ends up getting destroyed? That's a challenging tone. And then there's other questions that require more of a concern tone. A tone that shows more empathy. What's really holding you back from moving forward? 
See, that's a concern down. All right. And then number three, eliminating sales resistance to get your prospects to let their guard down. Now, what I'm, yes, that's a picture of me. I'm that old, long time ago. Now, what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna give you a little bit of my background because my background relates to what is necessary if you wanna take your income, your sales ability, your persuasion ability to a level that most salespeople only dream about. You see, I got in sales 22 years ago as a broke, burned out college student selling home security systems door to door. Who, who in here sold door to door before? Let me know my people. Okay, you know what I mean, right? So the company, they basically hire everybody. It's straight commission. Who cares if you don't sell? No skin off their back. You don't sell, you don't make any money. They basically give you a script and they give you a couple books by the sales gurus and they drive you out in a van and they basically like kick you out of the van and they're like, hey, go make some sales. It'll be easy. We'll pick you up after dark. And I still remember the last one being dropped off on the last street, my nerves, I'm a 21 year old kid, what did I know, I'm like a junior in college. And I still remember, I looked back at my sales manager in the van, his name was X Sane. he had this like curly like surfer hairdo, you know, the blonde hair, you know, and he's like, yo dude, he's like, Jeremy, he's like, J minor, that's what they call me, J minor, like, be excited, now remember, Show the prospect that you believe in the product. Show them that you're excited about it. Be enthusiastic. And if you believe in it and you show your conviction, then they're going to believe it. I'm like, that makes a lot of sense. If I believe in it, if I show them my enthusiasm, then somehow they're going to believe in it as well. I didn't know. So I started knocking on the doors and I was really excited. And I started talking about my features and benefits and how we had the best this and we were the number one this and we had the best customer service and we had the best quality and we were protecting all these homes. And I noticed from the very first door, I started getting all these objections. What? They didn't tell me about all that. And the prospects would say, we don't need it. Your price is too high. We already talked with somebody from your company. We already talked with other companies. We already have it. We like who we have. I need to think it over. I need to talk with my spouse. I need to do more research. Can you call me back a week, a month, a year later? Who in here has lost sales or deals because of one of those objections? Raise your hand. Only about half the room. Half the room does not lose any deals. You guys are spectacular. <laughs> Can I take your sales training courses? Oh, I love you. Now, I remember I finally got to a point after about seven to eight weeks of nonstop rejection, hardly making any sales. I remember one late Friday evening, waiting on the curb to get picked up. I'd worked 12 hours that day. Imagine the hot humidity, sweat dripping all down my chest, all down my back, my legs feeling like jello. If you've knocked door to door, you know what I mean? Your legs in the day, you're like, you're like just jello legs. I, st I still remember my right foot rubbing against like the hot asphalt. You know, like in July, just ugh, gross. I'd made zero sales that day, I'd worked 12 hours. In fact, that entire week, I'd worked 60 plus hours and made zero sales. So that meant I made how much? Oh, zero dollars, not good. And I remember thinking to myself, you know, maybe selling, maybe selling just wasn't for me. Have you ever felt that way yourself? Yeah. Have you ever looked into your bank account and you had more going out than you had coming in? That's where I was at. Completely desperate. 21 year old kid. Had a kid on the way. What am I gonna do? So my sales manager picked me up that night. He popped in a Tony Robbins CD that completely changed my outlook on everything. And Tony said something like this. I could be butchering it, Tony, if you're listening. But Tony said this. He said, you will fail. You will fail if you don't learn the right skills that are necessary to succeed. You will fail if you don't learn the right skills. That's why you came here, right? The right skills set you free. Without the right skills, how can you succeed? It's impossible. Right skills, succeed. Wrong skills, very hard, right? Failure, ooh, I don't like that failure word. I'd rather succeed. Now, when Tony said that, 
And it was, you know, he popped in one of, one of those CDs. You know, 22 years ago, they used to listen to these round things, like called CDs. It was crazy, incredible. Some of you don't even remember that. Now, when Tony said something like that, he, it's like a light bulb went up on my head. It was like, it's like divine intervention from the heavens above that maybe there was a difference in skill level, that some skills were far more efficient and effective than others. But there was a difference. I didn't understand that as a 20-year-old. So I thought to myself, maybe what the company was training me and what I was learning from the, what I called the old sales gurus, even though I'm old now, maybe they just weren't the right skills anymore. Maybe they're a bit outdated, didn't work as well. You ever wondered that yourself? So I committed to myself, damn, I'm going to have to do something. I'm going to have to acquire more advanced skills because I know you, like me, want to provide a great lifestyle for your family as well. Is that why you're here? Absolutely. Okay. Now, here was my dilemma. The company, you know, given all these books by the gurus, which I love. I respect everybody. You'll never see me talk dirty about anybody. But I was using these traditional selling skills. And I noticed when I used some of them that some of them would work. I would make a few sales. But I also noticed when I used a lot of their skills, they didn't work at all. I noticed that I would actually trigger more resistance. I noticed I would get more objections. I noticed that my prospects would stay more surface level when I asked questions and give me vague answers. And at the same time, I was going to college, like they said, and my major was behavioral science and human psychology. Now, I'm not going to give you the scientific stuff there, but it's really the study of the brain and how human beings make decisions. How is a person persuaded to do something and or not do something? Now, my behavioral science professors, one of them was by the name of Robert Caldini. Raise your hand if you heard of Robert Caldini. He's the head of behavioral science at ASU, Arizona State University. He's got books, Persuasion, Influence, world-renowned author. My professors, they were telling me that the most persuasive way to communicate was here. The sales gurus in their training programs and books, they were saying it was here. It was exact opposite. So I'm like, what am I supposed to do? So I'm like, how do I take what I'm learning about the brain and how it makes decisions and wrap that into a sales structure with the right questions, with the right tone? How do I get my prospects to let their guard down? So I started learning techniques to do that, that worked with human behavior, that would get my prospects to pull me in, that would get my prospects to do all the work rather than me doing all the work, that would get my prospects to sell themselves rather than me sell them, that would get my prospects to overcome their own objections rather than me throwing out rebuttals. And overnight, selling became very, very easy and exceptionally profitable. Now, why the hell did I tell you my background story? Because you don't care about me, you only care about who? You know, yourself, you're a human being, that's just human behavior 101. Why did I tell you that? Because I want you to imagine me within four years of that date where I almost quit, I was done, I was gone. Four years later, I was making multiple seven figures every year in commissions as a W-2 employee. Didn't own the company. Jeez, if I did, I would have made a lot more. Four years before, I almost quit. All because of what? I didn't have the right skills. I didn't have the knowledge. Okay? Now, I am not anyone famous. Like a lot of the speakers you're going to hear this week. In fact, I'm just like you. I'm just a person that decided very early on that if I wanted to have a better lifestyle, that if I wanted to make more money, I could not follow the status quo like everybody else was. That if I sold like everybody else, I would typically get what type of result? The same result, that I had to learn a much more advanced sales ability if I wanted to get to the top. You see, unfortunately for me, I wasn't born out of my mother's womb with advanced questioning skills. Raise your hand if you're born with advanced questioning skills. Oh, nobody. I wasn't born out of my mother's womb with advanced tonality skills. 
Raise your hand if you're born with advanced tonality. Oh, no. So salespeople aren't born salespeople. Is that what you're suggesting to me? I wasn't born out of my mother's womb with advanced objection handling and prevention skills. I had to acquire those skills. I had to learn those skills. So if a kid who grew up in the middle of Missouri on a cattle ranch outside of a town with less than 800 people can acquire those skills, what does it mean for you? It means you can acquire the same exact skills. You can make two, three, five, ten times what you're making now. You with me? Yes. Fist bump. Okay, now, how are we going to do it? Because it's all, it's all talk until we learn the right skills. It's just a dream, right? All right. Let's go back. How are we going to do it? Step number one, becoming a problem finder and problem solver, not a product pusher. No bueno. Product pushers don't do well. Now, raise your hand if the prospects you talk to have problems and or emotional needs. Raise your hand, please. Raise your hand. Raise your hand. Oh, this, you don't have any prospects, don't have problems or emotional needs? Mm -mm. No, no. Okay, raise your hand again. Keep your hand raised if your prospects you talk to have problems and or emotional needs. See, there's never been a product or service ever invented that doesn't solve a problem and or emotional need. Do $500,000 Ferraris solve a problem? Not really. If you want to go from point A to point B, you can drive a used Honda. But it does solve a what? An emotional need. Maybe it gives you higher status. Maybe when you're a kid, your dad said you're never going to mount something, so you want to prove him wrong and drive around with your Ferrari. Maybe you want to show your classmates that picked on you as a kid that bullied you that you've arrived and you're successful. It solves an emotional need. Your industry solves both. That's the power that you have. Okay, now, raise your... Oh, here's what I want you to do. On a piece of paper, I'm going to give you 23 seconds, not a second more. You might want to write these down because I'm going to come around and ask you. I want you to write down the two biggest problems that your prospects have. I know I'm not crying. I have dry syndrome, so my puncture plugs are plugged, so I'll be crying all day. Write down the two biggest problems that your prospects have. Two biggest problems, you've got 13 seconds, that your prospects have. Two biggest problems. Two biggest problems. Now, look at the two problems you just wrote down. Raise your hand if your solution solves those. Raise your hand if your solution solves those. Only about half the room's solution solved those. What, you, your solution doesn't solve the problems? I'm not understanding. Oh, maybe, okay. Now, so what you're telling me right now is that your prospects have problems and your solution solves those. So if your prospects have problems and your solution solves those, why are they not accepting your offer? What's the missing link? Can I suggest to you what it is? The missing link is not your leads, even though you think it is, my damn leads, they have this broke mentality, uh, they can't overcome their fear. It's not your mindset. It's not that you don't journal enough or take enough cold showers, or you know, <laughs> meditate enough. I love that for your personal life. It's not gonna help you when the prospect says hello and you don't know what to say and ask, is it? Let's be real. I'd love it to be real. If I took cold showers, I could sell 10 times more, but I'm just a realistic weirdo. All right, it's not that you don't believe in personal development, which I love personal development, and it's not that you're not motivated enough, and it's damn right that you don't work hard enough. Raise your hand if you work hard. I mean, everybody works hard. I know tons of entrepreneurs and salespeople that are, work 14 hours a day that are dead broke. So if it's none of those things, what on earth could it be? Now, can I ask you a cheesy question before I show you what it might be? Like an obvious question, I already know the answer. Like, really cheesy. You guys, you okay with that? Okay. Raise your hand. Actually, no. Raise your hand if you want to triple the amount of deals you did last year over the next year. Like you want to triple. And if you haven't started yet, raise your hand if you're brand new and you want to triple the amount of deals that the average first year person does. Okay, so everybody keep your, okay, keep your, okay. Now I'm gonna ask you this. Keep your hand raised if you can triple the hours you're working now. Cause you want to triple your deals, so you have to do what? Triple your hours? No. Oh, oh. So you're, you're telling me that you can't work like 24 to 30 hours a day. I don't think it goes past 24. So if you want to triple your deals, what are you gonna have to do? You're gonna have to 
acquire a much more advanced sales ability than you currently possess. Am I right? Okay. Now, who in here likes to read books before we get into some industry specific stuff? All right. I love reading books. In fact, the first sales seminar I ever went to was in 2001 with my good friend now, Brian Tracy. Raise your hand if you've ever heard of Brian Tracy. Brian said one thing on there that completely changed my life. From that day forward, I literally walked out of the event. It was on a Saturday. I turned off the radio and I started listening to sales persuasion and influence. So from that day forward, that day, literally that day forward till now and continue it, I've either read or listened to five books a month times 12 months a year. That's 60 books a year on sales persuasion influence times the last 22 years. If I've done my math right now, I could be off. I'm from Arkansas. We don't really know how to add down there. You know what I mean? I love you, Ar I, I'm not from Arkansas. But that's 1,360 books on sales persuasion influence. I've already done two this month, but who's counting? 1,362. Now, everybody, do you, how do you read five books a month? Oh, I don't. I usually read two, and then I listen to three. Because instead of listening to Taylor Swift, I love you, Taylor, or listening to my favorite pump me up songs or listening to the radio politics, which how much of that, how much money does that make you every month while you're driving around the car? Oh, bagels, zero. Now, in every single book I've ever read, besides it saying always be closing, what's a big term that they always say? You have to be a what? A problem solver. But as I started to really think about problem solving, problem solving does not happen until after the transaction is over. Because if they don't accept your offer, how in the hell are you a problem solver? See, problem solving happens after you acquire the home and it's yours. That's when you actually solve the problem. So if you wanna get really, really good at selling, you have to be much better at problem finding. Problem finding, you might wanna write that, down, that term down. Now, what is problem finding? Problem finding is asking the right questions, but at the right time, that helps your prospects uncover problems in their mind that they didn't even know they had. Because when you first start talking to a prospect, as you know, most of them don't even really understand that they have a problem, right? Or maybe they know they have a problem, but they're not really sure how bad the problem really is. They don't know. Or maybe they don't understand the consequences of what happens if they don't do anything about solving their problems. Am I right? Now, what are most salespeople? I hate to say this, most salespeople are what we call, I didn't want to say this, you might get angry at me, problem, well, they're product pushers, yikes. I think my time's off here, I was supposed to have 65 minutes, I think it started me at 55, just saying. I love you. All right, so most salespeople do what? They ask a few logical based questions. Hey, if we could give you an offer in 30 days, same as cash, would you be interested? And it's a yes or a no. And if it's a no, they try to battle them with their rebuttals. How many of those deals do you win? Oh, hardly any. Playing the numbers game, right? Oh, that sounds really drastic. So they do that, and then they go into their what? Their pitch. Talking about the features and benefits of services. They have the best this, they have the best that. That is like taking a bucket of mud and throwing it up against the wall hoping and praying that something you're going to show them on slide 12 is going to magically cause them to want to buy from you, to accept your offer. We call that hopium. It's a drug. It's a drug that so many of you are taking. So many salespeople, so many entrepreneurs take the hopium drug where they just hope and pray that it's miraculously going to all work out. That is such a hard and unpredictable way to make a living. Don't do drugs if you want to be in the top 1%. It's not good for you. Okay, now, let's go. Step number two. We're going to get into some more industry-specific stuff as we go. Asking the right questions, but at the right time and with the right tone. Now, let's go back to where I was at. Remember, I was at college, major in behavioral science, human psychology, social dynamics, to study the brain, how human beings make decisions. How is an individual persuaded to do something and or not do something? Now, oh, actually, I'm going to go back. I ruined it for you. <laughs> Let me ask you this question. According to behavioral science, there are three forms of communication. I would say, can you see me up here okay? Am I in the light? Okay. Three forms of communication. I suggest that you write these down because even if you're already doing well, this will be a completely 
game changer for you. So era number one way of communication. I'm not gonna give you the scientific term for it, and I already gave it away, good Lord. But if I said the words, boiler room selling, what's the first image that comes to your brain? Boiler room selling, what's the first image? I just saw it, what's the first image? Boiler room selling, what's the first image that comes to your mind? Boiler room selling. What would be this? Wolf on Wall Street. See, I already ruined it. Wolf on Wall Street. Uh, got to sell on the opportunity. Hey, I've got a great opportunity for you. Then we push and we pressure them and tell them why they should go with us. And we try to convince them and we throw out rebuttals. But according to the data, oh, the pesky data, I hate data. According to behavioral science, that is the least persuasive way to sell. Right? You got to play the numbers game. You guys like playing the numbers game? It's a lot of fun playing the numbers game, right? Yeah. So we're the least persuasive when we tell people things when we attempt to dominate them or posture them or push or pressure them or manipulate them into doing something that we want them to do. It's just like if you told your spouse or your teenager that they really, really need to do something and then you push and pressure them, what do they typically do back? They push back. See, that's just human behavior 101. Now, I'm gonna show you a few forms of the least persuasive way to sell. Now, hold on. Are you sure you want me to show you this? <laughs> It's really going to mess with your mind starting on Monday when you get back on the phones if I show you this. So I can shut this down where you just you keep taking the, the blue pill and go through the numbers game. Red pill. Or I can give you the red one. What do you want me to do? Red pill. Okay. Presenting. Oh, Jeremy, you're crazy. I have to have a great presentation. According to the data, very low on the persuasion pole, especially when we have 60 to 90 minute slide decks and we talk about our features and benefits and why we have the best this and we have the best that. Here's a, here's a picture of our, our corporate offices. Here's a picture of all of our awards. Here's a picture of our founders. They have the most integrity. Here's a picture of our JD customer service. Blah, 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 blah. In one ear, out the other ear, right? How many salespeople do you know that say, yeah, we're the sixth best in the market. <laughs> they all say what? That they're the best, that they're number one. So just so you know, psychologically, when you say words like that, that every salesperson is telling your prospects, it sells anything to them from a vacuum cleaner to a life insurance policy, to a car, to cybersecurity, maybe they're calling their home to purchase it. When you sound like everybody else, how does a prospect start to view you? Like all those other pushy salespeople. No bueno, not good for you. According to the data, it's not very persuasive if your presentation is more than 10% of the entire conversation and or conversations. And that's the big problem. Because in every industry, we train 158 different industries, including yours. We looked yours up right about a couple days ago, about a week ago. Your industry, along with real estate agents, because you combine those in industries, is the fifth largest that we train in the United States. In your industry, it's actually over 50% of you are presenting and talking most of that conversation. No bueno. You gotta get that down to 10%. That's a whole nother training. Telling your story. Hate to tell you this, nobody gives a damn about your story when you're selling one-to-one. -one. Whose story do they care about? Their story, oh my gosh. Putting sales pressure on them. Do you do that? Be real. Be real. See, there's a big difference in getting your prospect to feel so much internal tension from your questioning and tonality ability when you build a gap from where they are to where they want to be compared to putting external sales pressure on them. Nine day difference in the money you're gonna make. Now, and the big one, oh, the big one you're gonna, oh, you're gonna get upset at me. The big one, let me take a drink of water before I say this. Deep breath. Assuming the sale, especially early in the conversation. According to the data, very low in the persuasion pull. And that's exactly why most of the sales trainers that you've probably been made to learn from say what? That sales is a what? Oh, a numbers game, right? Sales is a numbers game. Sales is a numbers game. So basically, well, here's what they say. Sales is a number game, so you gotta work harder, you gotta call more leads, you just gotta put in the time, you gotta get thick skin. Sales is a numbers game. Do you know what they're basically saying to you? It's this. 
what we're training you doesn't really work that well. So unfortunately, you're just gonna have to work longer and harder hours, <laughs> thank you very much. Just work harder, hustle muscle. You're just gonna have to call more leads, put in the hours. How the hell does that give you any type of competitive advantage? Mm, I'd rather play the skills game and focus on each conversation and the quality of those conversations. Now, selling will be a numbers game if all you're using is traditional selling skills that trigger resistance, that trigger flight of flight. Now, second mode of communication, I gotta run, I'm behind, is consultative selling. Raise your hand if you heard of this, consultative selling. Now, this came out in the 70s and 80s with methodologies like Sandler Institute, spin selling, Neil Rackham, college professor, never sold anything by the way, taught that you needed to ask logical based questions to find the needs of the client. But what's the potential problem if you only ask logical based, we call those surface level questions. What type of answers is your prospect gonna give you in return? Logical based surface level answers. And do human beings buy on logic or emotion? Emotion, brain studies show that you've all heard of that. So once again, more persuasive than telling your story, pushing, pressuring, but you're still playing the numbers game because very little emotion is brought out by simply asking logical based questions. And that is why you can never sell to the needs of the client. Oh, that's blasphemy, Jeremy. I have to sell to their needs. Well, that's what you're missing because most of your prospects don't even know what they need when you first start talking to them. Am I right? Can I give you an example of this? Now, this is for illustrative purposes only. This is not gonna happen to any of you. Let's say you wake up in the morning and you got a, oh, you got a really bad headache. Yikes, I'm gonna miss the event. I get this huge migraine. I need to go to urgent care and get some headache medicine. What's it gonna cost me with my copay? Maybe, maybe 50 bucks or something like that. Uh, so you go to urgent care because that's what you think you need. And the doctor, she starts asking you some very pointed questions about the pain and where the pain is at and how long have you had the pain and what the pain feels like and what the pain's preventing you from doing and other questions. And her questions start to cause you to feel so much, what? Internal tension that you might have a much bigger problem than you originally thought you had. She then suggests that you need to go do, not you, a CAT scan, illustrative purposes only, and it comes back that you have a, term, a tumor. It's terminal, you got 30 days to live. $2 million surgery to solve that problem. Well, the, you thought your budget was gonna be 50 buck copay. Well, the hell with the budget because now you know what? Now you know what your real problems are. You didn't know that before. And if the doctor just give you, here you go, you might not live because she found out. That is why you never sell to the needs of the prospect. You sell to the real problems that your question ability allows them and you to find. Are you with me on that? All right, third four, I'm gonna fly through this because we gotta get to the industry specific stuff. Never use questions like this. We see a lot of scripts from every industry. We have sales trainers all over the world. I, these come across my desk every day, thousands of them. Don't ask questions like, what problems are you having with the house that are keeping you awake at night, George? Surface level. How about this, within the first two minutes of a call, I mean, if we could agree on a price, is selling within the next few months an option? Or how about this one? Are you willing to take low ball offer within the first two minutes? How, are you, how, can they, how can they know if they're willing to take a lower offer within two minutes when you haven't even built a gap from where they are to where they want to be? See, that is why you're just getting the laydowns. What percentage is the laydowns of your market? 2%? What about the other 90% that have problems? 98% that have problems? See, that's what you're missing. I'd rather learn how to sell to everybody. Now, the third mode of communication, the most persuasive according to the data, behavioral science, we're the most persuasive when we get others to persuade themselves. That's called dialogue. When we ask, write this down, neuro-emotional persuasion questioning. That stands for NEPQ. Now, when I talk about NEPQ questions, I'm not talking about questions that are designed to get people to say what you want them to say, or surface level questions. The questions I'm referring to are questions that are meant to bring out your prospect's emotions, to trigger what's called their emotional drivers, to get them into what's called their emotional state. What's the biggest emotional driver in a human being that causes them to want to change? Pain 
or the fear of future pain. See, without helping them feel pain, there is no sale. There is no offers accepted. Without pain, they stay in the status quo and their problems stay the same. Now, here is NEPQ. I don't have time to go through all these questions. We train a lot of people in your industry. Some of the biggest companies and influences you're in your industry, you probably don't know we train. They like to keep it a secret because they don't want their competitors learning what we're training them. Would you? I wouldn't either. All right, so this is the stages. Now, would you like, to, would you like me to give you a few industry specific examples for your industry? How to tie NPQ to what you sell? Yeah. You okay with that? Yeah. Okay. All right, here's what I'm gonna show you first. Something you have to understand, especially if you cold call or talk to outbound leads, okay? They're flaky, which a lot of them are. Within the first seven to 12 seconds of any conversation you're ever gonna be in, I don't care if you cold call, outbound leads, inbound leads, or if you're talking like this, you were doing it to me when I came out, weren't you? Your prospects are picking up on your verbal and nonverbal cues subconsciously. We can't even help it as a human. It's the way God wired us. So we're picking up on your verbal and nonverbal cues based on what you're saying and asking and how you're using your tone that triggers the brain to react in one of two ways. Now that could be damn scary, react. Now, if you come across aggressive, if you come across too excited, like, hey, really enthusiastic, like the salesperson usually does, you come across needy, you know what I mean? You ever been on a call and you're like, I need the sale. You think your prospect, you feel like your prospect picks that up? Oh, they pick it up times 10. And if you, especially you come across attached and you don't understand the right questions to ask, you don't understand how to use your tone, it triggers your brain to go into what's called fight or flight mode. You've heard of that, right? But you thought it was the prospect's fault that they were going into fight or flight mode. But it's actually whose? We're the ones triggering that reaction. As soon as you start to understand that, then you can make changes. Instead of blaming the leads, now we're like, what? how did my tone come across that triggered her to say, enough with the questions, just tell me an offer and I'll tell you if I'm interested. What triggered that? Did she wake up that morning? When she asked me that third question because her tone ends on the high pitch, I'm gonna go into fight or flight mode and tell her to get lost. Now that was a triggered reaction. Now, once you learn what we train you, which this is just the beginning, is training something, as my good friend Bradley always says, is training something you did or is training something you do. Well, if you want to make a lot of money, it's something you do every day, right? Now, once you learn how to come across more neutral, more unbiased, not quite sure we can even help. You don't know enough information. You learn how to come across more collective, still assertive. I don't mean be boring, but you come across collective, more calm, like a expert does. You understand the right questions. You understand how to use your tone. It causes their brain to become curious enough where they want to engage and actually open up to you. Now, how do you get your prospect to view you at a much higher status than a salesperson? How are salespeople viewed in society at large? At a much lower status. Even if you make a lot of money, you're viewed at a lower status. You're already competing against a lowered status. So how do you raise your status? How do you come into any conversation and within the first few seconds, cause the prospect to feel you are at least at the same status as them. And throughout that conversation, eventually your status rises in their mind where by the end they view you as an authority, the expert in what you're talking about that. Now in behavioral science, this is called social dynamics. Write that down. This is very important for you if you wanna make a lot of money. Now, I'm not sure I should do this. Maybe I will. Should I show you some predictable questions that most salespeople have been asked in your industry, in every industry, that automatically lower your status in most of your prospects' mind? Because here's your problem. If I show you this, because I know 95% of you do this, you're gonna have a hard time on Monday. So I'm a little bit concerned that you're gonna now start to overthink things. I'll show you if you want. 
Yep. Okay, all right, I just gave you a warning. So when we ask predictable questions like, hey, how you doing today on a Zoom call? Are you on the call? Hey, do you have two minutes of your time? Hey, listen, how's it going today? How are you doing? Oh yeah, where do you live? Oh, I love Dallas. Yeah, do you like the Cowboys? Yeah. Here's how most of your prospects <laughs> interpret those type of questions. I'm just trying to get you to like me so I can get you to accept my offer, sell you my thing. Am I right? Because that's what you do when salespeople ask you that. So why are you asking the same questions that trigger you? And then you expect it not to trigger them? See, unless you're a lay down, that lowers your status automatically. You're gonna start noticing that on Monday, like, oh shit, what am I supposed to say? Oh my gosh. Now, connection questions. Let's talk about any few connection questions. I'm gonna give you a few industry specific examples. This is where you learn how to take the focus off you and put it on the prospect immediately to get the prospect to let their guard down. Now, I know a few of you are nervous right here because I can read that from your body language. I'm not gonna call you up on stage, <laughs> at least not right now. I can see, I can see your facial expressions. Okay, so let's say that you're, uh, what do you guys call them? I know the term in all these industries. Yeah, you got like, uh, yeah, uh, inside sales agent typically. Okay, so let's say an inside sales agent's already called qualified them and booked them on with you. You're like an acquisition agent. Some of you call them then, right? Acquisition agents. So you're the, uh, you're the prospect. I'm the acquisition agent. So instead of now saying, hey, how are you doing today? How's your day going? Something like that. I'm going to get on there. Um, can, you, can you, let's say you're on Zoom. Yeah. How about that? We'd tweak this if you were, you know, like in the home or something like that or on the phone. We good? Yeah. Who's out there pulling the fire alarm? <laughs> Somebody's really scared. It's I'm going to show you guys this. It's nationwide. Okay. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Can you, can you uh, see me? You don't have your video on. No, everything's perfect. Are, are you in your pajamas? It's three. L Lord what am I going to do? Okay, so I've got some notes from Tiffany. Looks like you booked on the calendar about the Willow Lane home possibly selling, maybe to move on from the, the higher payment because of the, the divorce, right? Correct. Okay. Now, let's talk about what I just did there. Thank you. Okay, I want to show you what I just did. Let me go back. Okay, now, this seems basic, but there's a lot of psychology in what I just showed you. I'm associating them being on that Zoom with what? The end result, which is, in this prospect's mind, because Tiffany, my, my inside sales agent in the notes, said that they're going through a divorce and they can't afford the payment. So do you see how I'm already getting that prospect into what? Results-based thinking over cost or price-based thinking. You see what I'm doing there? Now, why would I say the word possibly sell your property? Why not be assumptive? Why not posture them and say, uh, looks like you booked on the calendar about selling your property, right? Because if I'm too assumptive early in the conversation when I don't have any trust or credibility, you have a lot of prospects that will say, oh, well, I didn't say we were gonna sell the property. I just wanna see what you're willing to offer. We're talking to a lot of people and you automatically did what? You triggered sales resistance and you lowered your status no bueno see now you're having to work uphill where if we just have more of a neutral term there about possibly selling your property they're gonna say nope i'm not possibly gonna sell my property they can't do that it's too neutral see what i'm doing there okay let's go on way to go away this is called an nepq status frame can i have the chair back i apologize oh can somebody give me a chair how about we just put the chair here Thank you. Okay, you wanna come back here? All right, good. So this is a status frame. There's usually a couple of connection questions I'm gonna ask between. Now, okay, so Tiffany, um, she had mentioned that you were possibly interested in receiving like an offer on the property. Um, I, you know, I would say the first part of this call, it, it's pretty basic. It's, it's really more for us to find out kind of the condition the property's in and, and I don't know, kind of like really when and, and why you're wanting to sell the property because I mean, the, as you know, I mean, the way the market's been going, like we're just not able to buy everyone's house. You know what I mean by that? Absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. And, and then towards the end of the call, if you feel like, hey, you know, this might be what you're looking for, uh, we can talk about possible next steps. Would, would that help you? That sounds good. Okay, good. Thank you. Now keep the chair there. Thank you. Now, look what I did here. This is a status frame to help you raise your status. Look what I did here. I would say the first, and see, why would I downplay the call? Why not be super excited? Like, I'm so excited to talk to you. We can really help you because that's what everybody says. I want to downplay the call. That's called mismatching in behavioral science. That causes them to what? 
make it more important in their mind. Because if you're a salesperson and you upplay the reason why you're there, what do most prospects do? Downplay it, right? I want to make the way the brain works, okay? Now look what I did there. Did you see what tone I used? Kind of a curious tone. Kind of a, see how I leaned in? Like I'm softening my voice. Why would I have a softened tone when I'm doing that? Look what I said there. Because as you know, I mean, the way the market's been going, we're just not able to buy everybody's home. You know what I mean by that. See, what did I just do there? What did I just do there? I'm getting them to feel, eventually, it's not gonna be right there, I'm starting to get them to feel that I'm doing them a favor by purchasing their home at a much lower cost. I'm not begging them to accept my offer. And why would I say this? And then towards the end of the call, if you feel like, hey, it, it might be what you're looking for, we can talk about possible next steps. Would that help? No one is ever gonna say, nope, it would not help me to talk about possible next steps. Mm -hmm. See, maybe or might is a neutral word. I have to be far more neutral in the conversation while I build the gap from where they are to where they want to be. There's a lot more to that I'm gonna to have to move on. Solution awareness questions. There's a few more examples. Help them see what their future looks like once the newfound problems are solved. Let's give you an example. All right, now what do you do here? Let's say that halfway through the conversation, you ask them what type of price they're wanting to sell their property for. And they come back with a number, as you know, that's what? Really, really high, like full offer. Let's say they come back with, I don't know, uh, what did I put there? Let's say 350,000. I'm just gonna make up a random number. But you know that there's no way you're gonna be able to buy that home for them. You gotta go back and put together a proposal. And when you come back and you drop it by 100 grand, what does that do in their mind? Sticker shock. They're like, oh my God. So how do you start to seed in their mind without triggering resistance that you're gonna come back with a much lower offer and how do you get them warmed up to that idea? You want me to show you how? Okay, this is called an NPQ price anchor. Now if you do this in the first three minutes before you built any trust or built a gap, it's not gonna work that well. This is towards the very end of the conversation. See what I'm doing? Now, okay, so let's see. Uh, Give me like a, you want three, 320 grand for that. Absolutely. So you say like, I want 320 grand for the house. I'm looking for 320 grand for the house. Oh, 320. Yeah. Well, that could be trouble. Um, Dalton, if I, if I go to my partners and let's say they give me a number lower than that, I, I'm not sure what they would do yet, but I, I don't know. Let's say they come back and they're like, 320, they look at comparables and they come back with like 210, 220, 230. I don't know, somewhere in that range. Should I just go ahead and tell them to like kick rocks and pound sand and we can't do anything together? Or what do you feel like we should do? No, just go ahead and see what they offer and we can talk about it. That's typically what you're going to get. You're training a lot of people in your space to crush it. They'll be like, no, no, I'm not saying that. I mean, I want that. But just go ahead and talk to them and, and, and we'll come back and talk about it. What did I just see there? I've already seeded what? What have I seeded? That I'm gonna come back with a much lower offer. So when I come back, it's a lot easier for them to accept and talk about it. That's how you get rid of sticker shock. That's an NBQ price anchor. Now, let me give you a few more. Okay, NBQ consequence questions help your prospects see and feel what the consequences are if they don't do anything about solving their problems. Now, how many of you have almost, you've got a homeowner ready to accept the deal, they're about to go to sign the paperwork, and they call you and they say, oh, we really liked meeting with you and we really appreciate the offer, but <laughs> we decided to keep, uh, keep uh, the home. Keep in touch. <laughs> Raise your hand if you ever heard of that. Oh, bam. So what do you do? Throw out a rebuttal? What do you do? Argue with them? Why they need to really sell your home? How many of those deals do you win? Numbers game. I don't like playing the numbers game. That's not very fun. I'd rather play the skills game. So here's what you're gonna do instead. I want you to pay attention to my facial expression. I'm gonna stand for this so you can see. Can everybody see me here? I'm gonna pay attention to my facial expressions and my tonality. Okay? And your name is Dalton? Dalton. Okay, this is a consequence question. Watch this. Say you called me, say that to me. Yeah, we decided to keep the home. We really appreciate everything. Keep in touch. Thank you so much. Oh, that was really good. I mean, you said it already. Um, can I? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's not a problem. First, I'm going to agree with him. Yeah, yeah, I, that's not a problem. Um, can, I, 
Can I ask you something though? Yeah. Okay. How how can I communicate to you that you might be making a mistake without you getting upset with me? Go for it. What type of tone did I use there? Empathy. A concerned tone. And what does a concerned tone cause his brain to do? Open up because he feels like I'm concerned for his situation. I just seeded doubt in his mind without him triggering resistance where his guard's up. See how that works? That's the difference between making sales or not getting deals. Now, I might come back. There's a couple more conversations. I might come and say, I might say like this. Okay, let's go back. Oh, it got cut off. We'll just move forward. Okay, uh, let's keep going. Now, I don't have time to go through all these questions. What I did for you, because I was being nice. You guys, if you want, do you want more questions like this? So this is called the NEPQ Black Book of Questions. There's 273 more questions that you can use in pretty much any sales situation you're in, uh, all that you do. Gave you the QR code. I'm gonna give you five seconds to scan that. That's gonna take you to that Facebook group right there. It's called Sales Revolution. Right when you get in there, say, I saw Jeremy on stage, message me. I saw Jeremy on stage and somebody on my team will message you that black book. We just give it to you for free. Is that, would that help you if I did that? I'd love to give you a hundred more things to do because I just gave you a little nibble right there, but I gotta get to step three and I'm probably gonna get thrown off the stage. I think I have 10 more minutes. All right, eliminating sales resistance. This is the most important thing that you have to learn because it's all about neutralizing the hidden sales pressure that you're having with your prospects in the conversations you're having. Now, raise your hand if you've heard of the ABCs of closing. You ever seen this movie? Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, put that coffee down. Coffee's for closers. How, ooh, I'm gonna show you something. You, you just saw it. I think I get five more minutes because of that alarm, Ryan. How, ooh. That ABC is always be closing, pressure, pressure, pressure. How can I communicate to you that that mantra of always be closing is actually causing you to lose deals that you could be making? That our clients who are in your same industry make every day. You see, selling is not adversarial. It's not you against the prospect trying to win them over, manipulate them, pressure them. That's what average salespeople do. Selling, if you want to be a top 1% earner, is collaborative. It's you working with the prospect to help them find and solve problems they didn't realize they had. So from the very first words out of your mouth to the questions you're asking, we're going to follow that back there. That's called the ABDs of selling. Always be disarming. Make sure you write that down. Because when you learn how to let go, like let go of the attachment, the neediness when you're on your conversations with the prospect, it automatically takes the sales pressure out of the conversation and you're gonna notice your prospect lets their guard down. Now, who in here cold calls? Raise your hand. Okay, you want me to show you something? I saved the best couple of things for last. Do I have permission to show you this or should I just run, get off the stage? All right. Now, what if I told you, what does the average salesperson do when they cold call in your industry? Would it be something like this? Hi, my name is, I'm with XYZ Company. And hey, the reason why I was calling you was, click, because you sound like everyone else. And your prospect views you as low status salesperson trying to sell me something I don't need, don't want, can't afford. So instead of trying to convince them, why not disarm them? Why not get them to let their guard down? Now, what if I told you that we've written cold calling structures, every industry that cold calls, your industry, and we have some of the biggest names in your industry, their sales teams are getting 71%. You don't even believe me if I showed you that. 71 freaking percent of any person that answers that phone on a cold call after 10 minutes to book in with an acquisition agent. You wouldn't even believe me, would you? Just like this dude. I'm a cold caller for a real estate investor, huge real estate investor, you all know him. I call distressed homeowners off the market. This cold call script is insane. I was having 11% of all my conversations, booking appointments, now after a week of practicing the script, 71%. It's actually higher in their company now. It's like 73, 74%. It's been a couple months. Should I show you? Are you certain? It's gonna be hard for you to go back to the old way. I'm just warning you. Okay. So how do we trigger curiosity? Oh, I gotta get a drink for this. 
I did a reel on this a couple months ago, and about half the comments were like, there's no way in hell that would work. This guy's an idiot. Oh my gosh, like there's no way you can cold call and act confused. So stupid, this guy. I'm like, yeah, you shouldn't do that. Just keep doing what you're doing. Okay, so here's what we're gonna do. Okay, I want you to notice, I want you to hear the sound of these papers. I want you to, here's what I want you to do in your cold call. You're gonna go to the county and you're gonna print off the property tax records of every freaking house you're gonna call. This has to be real. There's no lie. Can you do that? Yeah, you can do that pretty much in every county. You're gonna hold them in your hand and you cold call, like this. Just hold a stack, I don't care. Yeah, is this Sally? Oh, hey, Sally, it's, it's John with XYZ Realty. Uh, listen, I'm holding a copy of your uh, property uh, tax records on your, it looks like your Willow Lane home there in Savannah. And I was wondering if you could uh, possibly help me out for a moment. What type of tone did I use there? Curious. Confused. What does a confused tone trigger in a prospect's brain? They want to help me. You're confused, you want to rescue somebody. Now, did you, why would I ruffle the papers there? What does that do in their brain? That's a massive pattern interrupt on a cold call. It triggers them to want to engage. Are you gonna hang up the phone if somebody says, I'm holding a copy of your property tax records on your 75 Willow Lane property there in Savannah, and I was wondering if you could um, possibly help me out for a moment. They're like, yeah, what, what's going on? Oh, you have my property check? Yeah. <laughs> see, I triggered. Did you see what I did when I walked out on stage and I sat there in silence for 30 seconds? What did that do in your mind? It's a pattern interrupt. You're not used to that, are you? It caused you to engage. See, we're working with the brain. We're working with human behavior rather than working against it. Now, let's keep going. Here's what we're gonna do. Uh, sure, yeah, what, what's going on? Well, I'm not even... I'm not even sure if it makes any sense for us to talk. I, I represent a, a group of buyers who are, uh, they're purchasing like, it's like five or six different properties. It's like that, you know, that four block area that the Willow Lane home is in. And after, after kind of going through your records, um, they, they asked me to reach out to you to see if you would be uh, maybe opposed to having a brief conversation around a, a potential offer. Would you, would you be opposed to that? I wouldn't. Okay, now, what did I just do that? What would I do? Well, I'm not even sure if it makes sense for us to talk. See how I push them back to get them to do what? Come, in. Come back in. Agreed. See, I'm not even sure if it makes, see, you guys are like, we really need to talk because, pushy. That's how it comes across in your brain, right? Because you're like, who's this? But I'm like, I'm not even sure if it even makes sense for us to talk. Their guard's down. See what I just did there? Yeah, I just, and I'm, I'm making it nonchalant. Like it's not a big deal. I represent a group of buyers. They're, they're just purchasing like five or six different homes in that four block area. And, you know, after they had me kind of go through your property records, they wanted me to call to see if you'd be opposed to uh, maybe having like a brief conversation about a potential offer. Would you, would you be opposed to that? I wouldn't be opposed. Why would I say opposed rather than would you be open? Because the prospect's brain on a cold call is already wired to say what word? No. I want them to say no. See, you're all taught that you got to get the prospect to say yes. I'm teaching you to get them to say no, which leads to yes. Not on every question, right? See what I'm doing there? I'm working with human behavior. Now, let's say they come back and they say this. Well, let's break it down. We already broke it down. Okay. I already did that for you. Let's say they come back. Ah, well, I'm not opposed, but dude, you're the fourth person that's called me this week. Like, can you just give me an offer and I can tell you if I'm interested? Let's say they could, remember when I had the three of you come back up on stage? Yeah. Right? You want me to show you what to do there? Yeah. Do you ever, who in here gets that objection? And what do you, well, do some of you really know what to say? Some of you are like, oh, I love you though. <laughs> don't take my water. I won't. You've been sipping, oh, you keep taking <laughs> you my water. That. I know, you, uh, I don't know. Okay, ready? So, if they say that, here's what I'm going to say. I'm going to agree with them. Oh, yeah, we'll go through that for sure. And, and just so you know, like without really understanding like the layout of the home and, and kind of the condition and those details, I really wouldn't even know what to, that we could offer you. I mean, it'd just be me throwing out some random price and it might not even be a good deal for you compared to what your home is actually worth. What did I just do with that? Yeah. Whose side am I getting them on now? It might not even be a good deal for you compared to what your home is actually worth. What are they gonna say that? No, I'm not, they're gonna, uh, they just stop. 
You're going to watch their guard down. Then you're going to go, so what I can do if it, if it helps you more is I can ask a few questions about kind of the, the layout, the details of the home. And once I understand that, then I can give you like a real offer to see if it fits into what you're looking for. Because, you know, at the end of the day, you might be better off just keeping the home. Are you with me on that? No one's ever going to say, oh, they're going to be like, oh, sure, yeah. Why would I say, good Lord, Jeremy, what are you doing? Why would I say, because you might even be better just keeping the home. What does that cause them to do? Causes them to trust you. It causes them to let their guard down. That's why we have 71% book to calls. Now, there's a lot more to that and in the front of that as well. Do I have a few more minutes or do you want me to, to go? You got to take a vote. Brian might, Brian's going to yell at me at, at the end. He's going to text me like, dude, you took all the time. All right, so you ever get an A-type personality that won't open up? Keeping their problems to their chest? And then what type of objection do they get? You, you ask them questions, they give you vague, generalized, surface-level answers, and at the end they give you what objection? I need to think it over. Oh, numbers game. So here's what you're going to do. Um, can, I, can I ask you something? I like that. Um, between you and I and, you know, off the record, what's the main reason why you might be looking to possibly sell the home? Between you and I and off the record, what's the main reason why you're looking to possibly sell the home? Confused tone, all right? You're going to notice they let their guard down. Let's say if you get one that you can't overcome their think it over objection because you're not in our training courses that we teach you how to do this for your industry, and you're like, I don't know what to do. You can do this as last resort. My throat's off. Um, can I ask you something before I leave? Between you and I and off, you know, off the record, what's really holding you back from moving forward so the home doesn't go into foreclosure? What type of tone did I just use? A concerned tone. Now, why would I put my hand on my chest when I ask that question? Feeling. Because it affects my tone. Your body language and your facial expression causes your tone to go in one of those directions where it's not monotone. You see where I'm at? Okay, we just went over. I'm out of here. Three steps to becoming the trusted authority, becoming a problem finder and problem solver, not a product pusher, asking the right questions at the right time with the right tone. Give you a few examples, little nibbles, eliminating sales resistance. Now, if you want to start learning this, if you want the slides, here's what we're going to do. This is our Wall Street Journal best-selling book, Barnes & Noble best-selling book, and uh, Amazon, I think. We have a huge deal with Barnes & Noble. There's the code. I'm going to give you 10 seconds if you want to get that book. Now, it's $17. I want to warn you. If you need a GoFundMe page to buy this, let me and Ryan know. So there's the code. If you buy it from Amazon, I'm going to be pissed because we have a huge deal with Barnes & Noble. It's in every store. We want more in every store. So what are you going to do? If you buy the book, if you follow me on Instagram, you have to follow me on IG there, tag me reading that book, and give me the scout's honor that you bought it from Barnes & Noble, and my team will send you these slides for free. Would that help you if we did that? Okay, so as I'm wrapping up, remember the quote that changed everything. You will fail if you don't learn the right skills necessary. See, this is why you're here the next three days. If you walk out of this room and you take Ryan's training, his advice, and everybody else is here, and you learn the right skills, it's impossible to what? Fail. Fail. It's impossible. If you walk out of this room and you don't go through that training, then, well, you kind of out on your own. So make the simple decision to acquire the right skills. If you acquire the right skills, you can do anything in your life. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. Alarm gods. Thank you.